here. All right, so morning, everybody. I think it's still, yeah, it's still morning. Um, glad to be here. Uh, I've done this lecture a few times now uh, for, for you all, and uh, I, I'll try to make it fairly digestible and manageable. Usually I come in after you've kind of reviewed a lot of the uh, pre-work path of fizz and, and all that good stuff. Um, so I'll try to not add too many layers of complexity here. The main focus that I want to emphasize today is just what are the dental implications of a lot of these medications. Uh, these are really common medications that you will see within the patients that you manage. Uh, I manage very extensively within these drugs um, in Virginia Garcia. So I'm a clinical pharmacist at Virginia Garcia in Cornelius. Um, and so we have patients referred to us for the management of, of these conditions, mainly hypertension uh, and dyslipidemia being really common cardiovascular conditions that uh, are pretty impactful to the patients as, as well as uh, their family members um, and pretty high rates of mortality especially in our country. So you're gonna be really familiar with these medications. You're gonna see them on a lot of lists. Some have fairly pertinent dental implications, some not so much, uh, but it's good to just be familiar with what they are when you see them on a med list. Um, and so these are some of the expectations that we've held you accountable to in the past. Mostly it's just being familiar with the medications, um, maybe being familiar with how they work and mostly looking at the adverse effects um, and being familiar with what those, which drugs have which dental adverse effects. So the cardiovascular drugs really focus on the management of high blood pressure or hypertension. So we're gonna talk about our antihypertensives. Hyperlipidemia, so elevated lipid levels, um, anti-anginal uh, medication. So this is where your heart is not getting adequate uh, blood supply. So you start having chest pain uh, and then anticoagulants and antiplatelets. And so we're going to be focusing kind of in this order on the various classes of medications that manage these conditions. This isn't going to be an all inclusive list of all the medications, just kind of focusing on the, the most common ones that you may see. And also some tricks on remembering what those medications are, because many of the medications in the classes end in a similar way. Um, so it's easy to recognize if you see an alol at the end of a name, you know, it's a beta blocker, for example. So first off, we're gonna talk about blood pressure um, and controlling blood pressure. So our body does that as, what, uh, as best as we possibly can. Uh, we do that through a couple different mechanisms. One of it is, one way is controlling cardiac output. So this is basically an equation. Some of you think mathematically, some not so much, uh, but I like to think about it this way because if you change either component in that equation, then you're going to change blood pressure. And so if you increase cardiac output, you're gonna increase blood pressure. If you increase peripheral resistance, you're gonna increase blood pressure. And so the medications that we utilize to manage blood pressure are going to focus on how cardiac output is controlled and how peripheral resistance is controlled. So heart rate and contractility. Cardiac output is basically how much the heart is pumping out, how much blood. So if you increase your heart rate, as you've all exercised or been stressed out in an exam, your <laughs> cardiac output was higher because your blood pressure or your heart rate was higher, right? So if we want to decrease blood pressure, what are we going to do that heart rate? Lower. Lower it. Yep. So the lowering of the, of the heart rate is going to lower cardiac output, going to lower blood pressure. Our other classes of medications often focus on peripheral resistance, and that's either looking at blood volume. So if we think about our blood vessels as pipes. If you put more liquid or more fluid through those pipes, you're going to see more pressure because there's more blood scraping against the surface, essentially. So we can lower blood volume by using medications that will have us release water, diuretics being the main classes there, or medications that open our blood vessels. So make it so more blood can go through those blood vessels or through those pipes. Another common system that is involved 
in some components of that equation we just talked about is the Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So there's a lot going on here. Basically, what I want to highlight is that from one single entry point through this angiotensin one, angiotensin two pathway, we see a bunch of downstream effects. So sympathetic activity. So that's norepinephrine, epinephrine. Um, when angiotensin II activates that, you see an increase. So that's going to increase your blood pressure, for example, because you're going to increase your heart rate. You're going to see reabsorption of sodium. So wherever sodium goes, what follows? Water. Water, right? So we're, if we're retaining water, we're increasing volume, we're increasing blood pressure. Back to that equation. So angiotensin II does that naturally. Same thing with some vasoconstriction here. If we constrict our vasculature, what's that going to do to peripheral resistance? It's going to go up. Smaller pipes, harder to push blood through it. So the resistance is higher, so our blood pressure is higher. So you can see how just inhibiting one area here in the, I'll do it with the, maybe there you go, so you guys can watch and see it on Zoom later. Inhibiting this area right here, so either the conversion of angiotensin II, inhibiting that, or blocking how angiotensin II works, all, it blocks all of these downstream effects, and all of these, if uninhibited, raise blood pressure. So when you inhibit it, it's going to lower blood pressure. And other beneficial things like kidney protection and whatnot. So this is a big class, a big area that many of our medications work. So the first class of medications I want to talk about are diuretics. Uh, these have been around a long time. There's a variety of different classes within the overall family of diuretics. So the most common ones that you're probably going to see for blood pressure are either HCTZ, hydrochlorothiazide, or chlorthalidone. Chlorthalidone is becoming more popular uh, lately, um, more, a little bit more effective. Our really potent diuretics are our loop diuretics. So those work in a different area in the kidney and work really well at relieving fluid. So oftentimes these are used for patients that have heart failure, that are having a lot of edema and swelling. They do lower blood pressure, but they're not as good at that. And then our potassium sparing diuretics, again, commonly used uh, in heart failure. Now, the biggest place that you might see um, implications or, or connections to dental care or dental health um, is this lichenoid reaction, uh, most commonly seen with thiazides and loops. Um, and this can happen at any time in the care or use of this medication. It doesn't need to be, I just started this medication, now I'm automatically going to have this reaction. We're not really sure what is connected to that and why some people get it and some people don't. Um, it is not a true, like, I think you guys think of this reaction and or see it more commonly at other times. It's not the same thing as, as a traditional lichens planus. It's like a different pseudo presentation. Yeah. Um, and so the best treatment for this is really just to stop the offending agent. And if you can't stop it, though, say you need that loop because you have heart failure and you are retaining a ton of fluid, and if you're retaining fluid, your heart's not going to work as well, um, then they might manage it with steroids. So oral steroids, corticosteroids to kind of decrease that uh, immune response that might be causing this. Electrolyte imbalances, you won't be monitoring those, but if those are out of, out of balance, um, those can have some significant effects, both on how the cardiac um, tissue and muscle works, uh, as well as overall confusion, how, you, how well you're thinking, especially if you have low sodium. All of these antihypertension medications are gonna lower blood pressure. All of them could be associated with some postural hypotension. So what that means, somebody's laying supine and they get up too quickly, their blood pressure goes from their head to their feet. And when it leaves their head, you get a little dizzy, lightheaded, and you could faint. So it's always a good idea to just have somebody kind of slowly get up, especially if they've been under for a long time or laying down for a long time. 
them sit on the edge of the bed before they get up too quickly. Um, this is a, a bigger factor the older you get, because as we get older, our blood vessels get harder. And the reason why all young folks don't all of a sudden just pass out when they get up too quickly is the blood vessels can change and contract as needed really quickly to keep blood in the brain. But an elderly person can't do that as well. And so they may get a little faint, lightheaded, and fall down. So diuretics can do that because they decrease blood volume pretty significantly in some instances. So they have a hard time getting enough to their brain at times. Another class that is really associated with postural hypotension are beta blockers. So this is one of those classes of medications that is easy to remember because they all end in a lull. So if you see a lull, it's going to be a beta blocker some way, shape, or form. These work in a variety of different ways, but the main way they work um, is by slowing heart rate. So if we think of that equation, slowing heart rate, slow, lowers cardiac output, lowers blood pressure. So for somebody with hypertension or cardiovascular issues, that's a good thing. We have different beta blockers or beta receptors throughout the body. Beta one is in the heart. It's easy to remember because there's one heart. Beta two is in the lungs. That's easy to remember because there's two lungs. So cardioselective work at beta one. The most common ones you'll see there are metoprolol um, or atenolol. And we have some non-selective and some mixed. So non-selective will work at one and two and mixed will work on one and two and alpha receptors. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit because that does have some dental implications in that blood pressure may be more sensitive to epinephrine or norepinephrine if used. And I know that is used in dental procedures, low quantities as a vasoconstrictor, uh, but you will see some case reports that some people can have um, effects of the, of the epinephrine. I don't think it, norepinephrine is used, in, right? Yeah, epinephrine mostly. Yeah, nor I think norepinephrine was too potent of a vasoconstrictor. So we have our, this is just an analogy or a little schematic here of how beta one receptors are working. Oh, question, yep. Um, I wanted to ask this, um, spironolactone, is that also used as like a acne medication? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so if someone doesn't already have high blood pressure, but they get that acne, are they more likely to pass out or have low blood pressure? Oh, that's a good question. Um, actually, uh, so the question was if it's used for acne, because it can be used for acne, it's actually um, anti androgenic, so it blocks um, testosterone, the androgenic hormone to some degree. Acne? As in skin? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, so if males take it, they can actually sometimes get the adverse effect of gynecomastia, which is breast tenderness because it's blocking the testosterone and, and you get more exposure to estrogen, you're, you're out of balance. Um, so you can use it in acne for the antiandrogenic effects, uh, but the doses that are used are really low and they really don't affect blood pressure, like 12 and a half to 25 milligrams. And you might get blood pressure effects more in the 100 range or higher. So good question though. Everybody responds a little different. They may see some effects, but it's probably not too significant, especially if they're young, which they're often using uh, that at a younger age for, for acne. Um, but yeah, good question. I always forget about that. I teach cardiovascular. I don't think of like sexual, um, you know, reproductive health topics that we talk about. Um, so uh, we have our sympathetic uh, hormones in our body floating around all the time. And that's epinephrine and norepinephrine. And they have different actions on these receptors. So beta one, when it's activated, is going to increase heart rate and increase contractility. So when you use a beta blocker, we block that and we see the opposite. That's why we see a slowing in heart rate. I'm jumping ahead of myself because I have a, an animation for that. So if we have metoprolol, we block that receptor. We see the opposite effect of what usually happens when you bind epinephrine or norepinephrine. But none of these others are opposed because it's cardioselective. It only blocks 
beta one. So you see, a, uh, and you guys know a medication that we use that works at beta two receptors, it's commonly used in asthma. What is it? Albuterol. Albuterol, yep. And again, it ends in all, so you can remember there's some type of beta activity there. Um, so if somebody has asthma, they can use metoprolol, but still have effect, efficacy of their, of their albuterol if they have asthma or if they have breathing issues. Now say we use a non-selective beta blocker like propranolol. Well, now that blocks beta one and beta two, um, but we have unopposed alpha one activation. And so we just said that there could be some issues, excuse me, with um, using epinephrine and, and hypertensive crises or elevated blood pressures. And that's because at higher doses, you could overstimulate that alpha one receptor causing too much vasoconstriction. And if we think about pipes, we have narrow pipes, we have higher blood pressure. When we have the beta two blocked, usually beta two and alpha one work together because beta two relaxes blood vessels and alpha one constricts them. So there's a balancing act. But when beta two is blocked, you don't get that vasodilation anymore and you only get constriction from the alpha. And so that's where the blood pressure rises are seen. Now, the concentrations that you guys use really is not getting into the system or lasting long enough to have an effect, like maybe 20 minutes. They, they've done studies where you might see like six millimeters of mercury increase, which is really minimal. Um, hypertensive crisis, we're talking like blood pressure greater than 180 over 100. So hypertensive crisis and urgency, that's like really high. And if we think a normal blood pressure is being 120 over 80 or lower. So um, nonetheless, you have to keep an eye on blood pressure if somebody has cardiovascular disease when they're coming in to have uh, a dental procedure to, uh, done, both blood pressure and heart rate. So our next class is ACE inhibitors. This works in that RAS system, the Renin system that I showed you with the big flow chart. Another easy one to remember because they all end in krill. Um, so they inhibit the conversion of angiotensin II. There's a laundry list of ACE inhibitors available. There's only three of them, but they all end in prill. So if you see prill, you know it's an ACE inhibitor. Really not a ton of implications for dental hygiene or dental health. There is one condition that can develop that involves the mouth region, and that is um, I forget all my animations. <laughs> and that is angioedema, uh, which is a swelling, significant swelling of the lips and tongue. Every year I say I need to get a new picture because I think it's just sticking his tongue out farther. <laughs> it it's, not really, <laughs> it's not really angioedema, um, I don't think. But it's, it kind of looks like it's like an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, it's not, um, but it can impede breathing. Um, dry hacking cough is also a really common uh, non-serious adverse effect. They just doesn't really bother. It doesn't really impact anything. It just kind of bothers. They just cough for no reason. Um, hyperkalemia can cause some arrhythmia, so you have to keep an eye on potassium levels. The next class of medications that is very similar to ACE inhibitors are angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. And these are basically two of the same classes. They just work in a different spot. So ACE inhibitors inhibit angiotensin conversion, while ARBs block the receptor that angiotensin II binds. But the ultimate effect is relatively the same. There's a lot of these as well. These are the two most common you'll probably see. They all end in sartan, some degree. So easy to remember as well. The big difference here is that they work in that different area blocking the receptor. Um, so they don't lead to an increased risk of cough and little to no risk for angioedema. So if somebody develops angioedema on an ACE inhibitor or cough, we might switch them over to the ARB. This is important, especially for people that have chronic kidney disease, where these two classes of medication can really slow the progression 
or worsening of CKD. Um, so if we can get them on one of these two classes, that'll be great. As well as like major cardiovascular benefits as well. Yeah. The teratogenic, does that mean it might cause like heart defects? Yep. So the big issue for her question was regarding teratogenicity or birth defects. Um, and so it's not necessarily a birth defect in that it'll be born and there'll be something wrong. It's that it can kill the child because it um, works on our kidneys and can impact how well our kidneys perfuse and filter our blood. And so if it works in our kidneys, when a mother takes it, it also works in the babies, but it works too much and can cause renal failure in a developing child. So if anybody of childbearing age has hypertension or some indication for an ACE or an ARB or is considering getting pregnant, they should not use one or they should use multiple forms of birth control just to be safe. I have a quick question. Yeah. So the ACE inhibitor blocks it going from angiotensin one to two, but the ARB blocks, it gets to angiotensin two, it just doesn't get to the receptors. Right, it's okay. just kind of, you'll see here that bonk, that big oh, thing okay. drops in there. And now it just bounces off and doesn't work. Uh, I didn't say it, uh, but I, we can talk about it. So the reason why there's a cough or angioedema concern is when you inhibit ACE, rather than converting angiotensin 2, you convert a byproduct called bradykinin. And bradykinin, when it builds up in the system, leads to that cough and that angioedema. The biggest time that becomes a factor is if you're considering use of an ACE inhibitor in the black population and that they're more sensitive to bradykinin. So incidence rates of cough and angioedema is higher in those patients. Not that you can't use them, they're very commonly used, but you just need to monitor for those effects. <coughs> Any other questions on the RAS agents, Brennan agents. Not a lot of dental um, implications there. So next we have our calcium channel blockers. We have two different classes within this general um, overall classification of calcium channel blockers and that we have the dihydropyridines. These ones are nice because they all end in peen. Looks like pine, but you, but you say it peen. So we have a few there, there's more than, than that, but there's amlodipine, pilotipine, and nifedipine. And then our non-DHPs, which are verapamil and diltiazem. There's only two of those, so not many to keep track of. Big differences there are the DHPs make the blood vessels larger, vasodilate. The non-DHPs work like a beta blocker and they lower heart rate. So different areas where you might consider using them. Dental implications though, especially for the dihydropyridines and in particular nifedipine is the potential for gingival hyperplasia. So an overgrowth of the gums over the teeth. Um, main treatment there, stop the med. Um, and it usually goes away. Uh, there may be some instances where it may need to be surgically reduced if it doesn't doesn't reverse, but more often than not, it's just stop the medication. Yeah. Did you say that's diastine? Uh, knife, no, uh, dihydropyridine or nifedipine. Oh, this okay. bottom one here is the most common offender of the, of the gingival hyperplasia. There is a, kind of segueing to uh, benzodiazepines a little bit, um, verapamil and diltiazem do inhibit an enzyme that is the most common enzyme for metabolizing drugs. It's called 3A4. That, that enzyme also metabolizes macrolide antibiotics, which are commonly used in dental procedures. And what, when you inhibit an enzyme, levels of a drug rise in your body, right? Usually doesn't cause too many issues, but some macrolides can cause QT prolongation, which is an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat. It's not a contraindication to use. You can give uh, erythromycin or azithromycin with these agents and not really have any issues, um, unless they are prone to maybe QT prolongation. Um, 
Benzodiazepines can also be metabolized by this enzyme. So those, if they're higher in our body, that can cause some, some issues. So those are our Xanaxes, right? Um, and so those can, if it levels get too high, can cause people to feel different effects. Um, some more significant than others. You all see bridesmaids, right? So when she's on the plane and she's kind of going all loopy, um, that can kind of happen. <laughs> so gingival, uh, oh, sorry, uh, dental implications, just as an overview, orthostatic hypertension, hypo tension, excuse me. So lowering the blood pressure too quickly when somebody stands up. That can happen with any class of medications. The other class, I didn't talk about it because it's not used as frequently for hypertension, but maybe used for BPH. So if you have an older gentleman who's using an alpha blocker, uh, that is probably the most significant or most notorious agent for causing uh, orthostatic hypotension. So have them get up slowly from the chair. Just make sure they're all balanced out. I'm not going to feel lightheaded. Depending on the operation, they may have pain. You may you may say, hey, take some Advil or take some naproxen. So chronic use of anti of, of anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs can impact how well blood pressure medications work. So if somebody has blood pressure, they're taking medication, high blood pressure. We all have blood pressure or we'd be dead. So it's important to think high blood pressure. So somebody has hypertension uh, and they're controlled previously. If they take NSAIDs for a long amount of time, they may not be controlled. They may see their blood pressure rise. So be cognizant of that. Maybe consider uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol as a pain reliever to avoid any issues with their blood pressure meds. Um, and then that lichens... Uh, reaction that I mentioned, again, most common diuretic, the most common is going to be uh, the thiazides and the loops. <clears throat> so the next class of medications we're going to talk about are those for um, angina. So this is where you're not getting enough blood to the heart. Um, many of the medications we already talked about are used for this as well. I'm not going to re-talk about those. But one class of medications we haven't talked about are nitrates. So the flow of blood can either be impeded by blocking the blood flow through a plaque. So plaque buildup, lipid, fat builds up in the blood, narrowing those pipes. Or the heart is working too fast. So exercise-induced angina can develop where somebody is fine at rest, but as soon as their heart rate goes up too high, the heart is like, hey, I am not getting enough oxygen and it starts to hurt. And basically that's lactic acid building up. We've all worked out and we've gotten sore muscles and tired muscles. It's the same thing. The heart is really resi resilient. I mean, it beats nonstop, right? It never gets tired. But if it doesn't get enough blood flow and oxygen, it's gonna wear out. And the issue with this, the reason why we wanna correct it is because if you have pain, that means you're not getting oxygen to the muscle. When muscle doesn't get oxygen, it dies. And that's what leads to a heart attack. And so we don't want muscle tissue to die because it doesn't work as well. And if muscle tissue dies, it doesn't work as well, you get heart failure and you get a lot of other issues down the road. So one of the um, classes of medications that we use to give the heart more oxygen are our nitrates. So we could either have sublingual nitroglycerin just pop it under the tongue and you get a rush, really, that's what they feel, um, as their blood vessels open up and vasodilate. We have our chronic long-acting nitrates as well, isosorbide, mono, and dinitrate, relatively the same thing. Mononitrate's probably the most common. Um, main dental consideration here, again, hypotension, uh, as well as significant dry mouth, so xerostomia which that can have obviously lots of dental implications down the road uh, just due to the lack of saliva production. So angina or angina is uh, a, a significant, I won't say significant, but 
it can definitely present itself in the dental chair because of stress. The heart rate is going to increase potentially as well as the blood pressure. So it's always good if somebody does have ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, that's what uh, induces angina. Um, if they have sublingual nitroglycerin, they should have it with them. If some people know that being in the dental chair is gonna cause me symptoms, they can take it preemptively to avoid that. Many people may take nitrate tablets before they know they're going to exercise because we know that exercise is good for the heart. But if they can't exercise because the heart hurts, then they're going to gain weight. They're going to get less healthy. They're going to be increased risk for heart attack. So oftentimes they'll take a nitrate tablet or they'll take the long acting nitrate to avoid those symptoms. Because as soon as they have those symptoms, what does that mean? Tissue could be dying. Um, how long if they take it? How long is it effective for it wears off? So it can work within five minutes. It should work within that amount of time. And they usually will take one if they need it for symptoms, like I've been every um, 15 minutes. And so then it can last like, you know, 30 minutes or longer to see the effect. So they probably only will need one really during that time, but they can have it with them just if needed. If they do take one while they're in the chair, they can have some low blood pressure. So when you have them get up, make sure they get up slow because they're vasodilated, their blood vessels are big. Um, headache is the most common thing because their blood vessels open up and headache oftentimes is because of vasodilation. Our blood vessels are opened up too much in our brain. We get too much blood flow. Sometimes people like that actually because then they know it's working. So if they don't feel the headache or if they don't feel flush, because they will feel like a rush, um, then there's then there's concern. They're like, oh shoot, Come on, it's not, it's not working. You take another one. And you can get nitrate resistance if you take too much too fast. Um, so yeah, don't stress people out in the chair though. They probably don't have to make it. Uh, the next class is our lipid agents. Most common class here are statins, and they all end in stat. So some people will just say, I take a stat. And okay, there could be any number of those. Basically, they lower our bad cholesterol, our LDL. They do raise our good cholesterol, HDL, and lower triglycerides to some degree, but we're mostly focused on LDL lowering to avoid that plaque buildup, to keep that blood flow going at a smooth rate and not causing any cardiac issues. Um, you may see medications like Zetia or these new medications uh, called PCSK9 inhibitors that are really effective, also really expensive, also injectable, so they're kind of a pain to use. Um, so we're still gonna just emphasize on the statins because that's probably gonna be the most common thing that you see, uh, but really there's no dental implications. For completeness, it's a CV drug, so it's good to know. They actually have done studies that show that it has some pretty favorable effects to oral health. They tend to be pleiotropic, so they just work in a lot of different ways. Uh, they actually have a lot of anti-inflammatory effects, and so they've actually seen that people have pretty good mouth health uh, when they're on statins. And there's a big correlation, too, to better cardiovascular health and better overall dental health. And which one is affecting which? It's probably better dental health affects cardiovascular health, but it could go the other way. And then our last main class to think about um, are our anticoagulants or our antiplatelets. And the biggest thing to think about here is just bleed risk. So these are either inhibiting platelets from aggregating forming a clot or forming a scab, stopping your bleeding, or it's inhibiting in another uh, stream of the anticoagulation cascade. And ultimately <clears throat> we're using these if somebody's had uh, a clot or is at risk for developing a clot. So they don't have a heart attack, they don't have a stroke, they don't get a DVT, which is a clot in the leg, uh, which can lead to amputation or pulmonary embolism, which can lead to, I mean, all of these could lead to death, uh, but uh, pulmonary embolisms are really severe 
obviously so heart attacks and strokes. Uh, so if anybody's at risk, say somebody has had a stent placed to improve blood flow to the heart, they put a cage in an artery, to open that back up to allow blood to flow through. Well, plates really like to stick to little metal cages that are in your blood vessels. Um, so you use antiplatelets to prevent the platelets from binding to those cages. People might have an arrhythmia. You may have heard of AFib, atrial fibrillation, or ventricular fibrillation. They're going to use anticoagulants to prevent clots from forming due to that irregular heart rate, a heart rate rhythm. Um, because that causes turbulence in the blood. You can get blood flow. If you look at it, it would like be swirling in the heart and around the valves. And when it swir swirls and is turbulent, it warms on the um, valves and in the blood vessels and can dislodge the clot to cause issues downstream. So we, we try to prevent that. And so we either block the antiplatelet, block the platelets, from binding or block fibrin from attaching to those platelets to create the plug, which our body does this naturally and it's very good because we don't want to bleed out if we cut ourselves. But those internal uh, cuts on vasculature and things like that, they're really small, but a really small clot can cause a lot of damage in a small capil capillary in your brain. Um, and so, we try to slow that down as much as possible. So you're all familiar with aspirin, I'm sure. That's the most common, longest standing antiplatelet. But we have clopidogrel, uh, as well as pasogrel and ty ticagrelor. No real easy way to remember these ones, <laughs> two of them end in grill. Um, Plavix is a common name that people like to say, or it's just easier to say, so patients will usually call it, I take Plavix. Uh, they may be on one or two agents simultaneously. So if they get a stent, they'll often be on dual antiplatelet therapy. Whether or not that increases somebody's bleed risk, that can vary. Um, more often than not, while their risk for bleeding increases, the risk for significant or severe bleed or bleed that we get really worried about isn't that much higher or something to be concerned about in simple dental procedures. And so somebody's just getting like a simple cleaning or maybe some scrapings done or a, a tooth removed, they should be continuing their antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the risk versus benefit, the risk of stopping an antiplatelet versus continuing it and then bleeding, which then you can stop through physical measures. You can use your, was it surge cell? Um, or um, tying it up, you know, uh, sutures, tying, suturing it up, um, can stop a bleed, but also continue the protection effect of the antiplatelet in the heart. Um, it takes a long time for somebody to bleed out. Right? We have a lot of blood. It does not take a long time for a clot to form to cause a heart attack or a stroke. So antiplatelets are usually continued, but keep an eye out on bleeding. We have our uh, anticoagulants, the most common, well, I'm not gonna say that now, it changes every year. We get more, we get more and more away from war warfarin. The oldest anticoagulant is warfarin. It was uh, developed after they like made a, uh, rat poison, because that's how they killed rats, is through them bleeding out, basically. And then they figured out we could use that as well, and it would help us. So um, coumarin, or, or coumadin is kind of the structure there. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's rat poison that we use to prevent a DVT. Uh, we monitor it with an INR, so sometimes you might see, what's that? Just a little rat poison. Just a little rat poison, <laughs> slightly different change there. Um, you might see that somebody needs to wait until their INR is to within a certain range before they can have an operation. Uh, everybody has a little bit of a different preference on what the INR should be at. Uh, there is more and more evidence coming out, though, again, that says as long as it's four or less, it's fine. You can have a, have a 
simple, um, moderately up to a moderate risk for bleed operation with no issues. Usually we try to keep people at two to three. And that's just a measure of how thin your blood is, basically. So the higher the number, the thinner your blood, the lower your number, the thicker. Everybody here not on warfarin, their INR is one. You can take all your INRs and it will be one about. That's like a normal. Um, INR stands for international normalized ratio. So it's all based off of that one and then goes up from there. Uh, so the risk for bleeding out again is you can get up to an INR of eight and higher. You're at risk, sure. You have really thin blood, but you might not bleed. Um, the risk of having a lower INR is much more severe. So continuing the warfarin, again, is usually done unless they're having a major operation in the mouth, like some type of a surgical operation into the jaw and the bone. If it's just some tooth removal, more often than not, keep it at two and a half, you're golden. So no lower than that. So the prothrombin time is the clotting time and the INR is the thinness of the blood? Well, it's so uh, general terms, it's all clotting time. It's all. Yeah. PT um, and INR are basically used interchangeably, just different values, uh, but they're kind of giving you the same thing. The uh, could be in journal as well, right? What's that? For example, the uh, other one, the side effect um, for bleeding, it could also be internal. Like, it could, yeah, definitely be internal. Yeah. So, so her question was, could the bleeding also be internal? And that's usually the more severe. Um, and where, when we do studies to test severe bleeding, it's usually internal bleeding that we're looking at, uh, because then that's what causes a lot of the um, more severe issues. Uh, so other blood thinners, and I call these blood thinners, that's actually a misnomer. Antiplatelets are blood thinners. Um, these are anticoagulants. They're just they're different. Um, but we have our newer agents, and these are called DOAX, so direct oral anticoagulation uh, agents, or NOAX. Basically, they just work in a different area in the coagulation cascade. So we either inhibit thrombin or we inhibit factor 10A. Much more favorable data coming out for these in both efficacy and safety. So you're seeing them being used more. However, they're more expensive because uh, they haven't been out as long, so they're brand name, many of them still. Uh, but they have their definite benefits and drawbacks. Drawbacks being they're still going to increase somebody's risk for bleed, but again, the risk versus benefit, it's a higher risk to stop the medication than it is to continue for a dental procedure. So just keep an eye on the bleeding and use something to stop it if it happens. It says limited reversal agents. That could probably be updated because there are actually quite a few out there now. Um, really expensive, oftentimes not used unless it's a really severe, severe bleed. So an overview of the anticoagulants, just really continue monitor for bleeding. If you are having a more severe or significant operation, um, you may discontinue the warfarin about five days before surgery. One of the issues with warfarin that's less favorable than our newer agents is it takes about five days to get to therapeutic level. And so it takes a really long time for it to get out of the system. So you have to stop it for five days prior to the surgery. Then after the surgery, it's going to take another five days for it to take effect. So that's 10 days where you potentially are not anticoagulated. So oftentimes you may need to bridge which bridging is just overlapping until you get back to therapeutic effects of warfarin with things like heparin or lovinox. Um, and then the bigotran, all the newer agents work relatively fast, like within a day. And some recommendations will say to stop day of and then resume right after or the following day um, to just maintain anticoagulation and to not lose um, any of that benefit. Okay, right oh, on time. Wow. <laughs> uh, thanks to everybody. Fast, I'm sure. Um, some of that will make maybe a lot 
more sense when you go back through and discuss the pathophys and physiology of these medications. But uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have after that, or you can shoot me an email as well uh, as you're studying. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I'll per, we'll post the Zoom and then I'll provide his email if you let it. Oh, yeah, That's absolutely. okay. So then you guys can always ask some specific clarifying questions if we get hung up next week. But we'll review it. So thank you. Okay, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll email this. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I'll post it.